situations that seem to be dead and he brings them to life. Amen. I love this song. Hope it's meaningful to you.
thankful today to do something special. We, uh, we talk all the time about how Jesus changes lives. That's a big deal to us. That's what we're all about. If you ever wonder what we're all about, the, the heart and soul of who we are is Recreate Church is a community of life and love who has a mission of leading people into a growing relationship with Jesus. Because we really believe if you get in touch with Jesus, he will change your life. It's one thing for me to say something like that and say Jesus will change your life. And it's quite another to hear the story of lives being changed. And that's what I want to do for you today. I want to give you the opportunity to hear some stories about lives being changed. David and Lucy Boudreau came to us when we were still at the high school. They've been with us for several years now. And they're going to tell their story. Now, if you, if you don't know Lucy, it's because you haven't stood still long enough for her to catch you. Because God has given her such a friendly heart. David's got a friendly heart, too. But uh, he's... You just can't keep up with Lucy. I mean, she's, she's all over the place. So I'm going to ask them to come and, and share their stories. And if you guys will come on up, and I'll help you get some things situated here, and we'll make sure everything's the right height for you. So if you will, give a big welcome to David and Lucy Boudreaux. sharing our story today and giving you my testimony is that we hope that you will see the amazing hand of God and his grace in our lives from start to finish. So I'm going to turn it over to David and let him start. I want to tell you all a story about a man named Dave, a poor Cajun boy, didn't know he wasn't saved. And then one day when he was feeling good as dead, down from the Lord came some heavenly bread, God's Word, Jesus Christ, that is, and this is my story. I was born in 1955 in southwest Louisiana, number four of six children, which I thought was a large family at the time, raised as a Catholic, but we didn't go to church very often, Easter and Christmas mainly, not much else. Portions of the Mass were in Latin. And the only thing I really got out of it as a child was Dominus Verbiscum, Ecum Spiritum Tuo, and I don't know what it means. <laughs> I never, the little missalettes that they put in the Bible, I mean in the pews, never had very much scripture from the Bible. And we weren't really encouraged to read the Bible by either the church or the catechisms which were held in the school classrooms before the regular school day started. I made my first communion around the second or third grade, and shortly after that, we moved from southwest Louisiana in 1963 to southeast Louisiana. That time, after that, we moved a few more times, and I changed schools multiple times from fourth grade on through high school. Now, being an introvert, I didn't make friends real easy, and I pretty much kept to myself. Around the fifth grade, I decided that catechism at the school wasn't for me, and I would rather be outside on the playground. Towards the end of the school year, and I had missed all of the classes, I found out that they were preparing for first confirmation, and I couldn't participate in the ceremony. Now, without first confirmation, I wasn't supposed to be able to go to confession and confess my sins to the priest so he could forgive them. I never told anyone about this, and no one ever asked. Despite my totally sinful nature, as far back as I can remember, I always believed in God. And I always believed His Son was Jesus, and I always believed that Jesus came and died on the cross for the sins of the world. There were actually times in junior high and high school I can recall people coming up to me and trying to tell me the good news about Jesus. But I didn't really want to hear it. 
In junior high, I also started experimenting with all sorts of drugs. I continued this behavior throughout junior high, high school, college, and actually a few years beyond that. After graduating from high school in 1973, I didn't go to college right away. I knew I wanted to get a degree, but I had no idea what, and so there seemed no point in going. When I finally did decide to go back to college, I got an apartment near the local university, and my neighbor happened to be a young lady. About a year later, we got married when I was 23. The church still had no part in our life much less a relationship with God. About two years after that, we had our first child in 1980, Elizabeth. She was a happy, healthy baby. I stayed out of college a year after that to try to get a handle on bills. In 1983, our second child, Ben, was born, and he seemed like a happy, healthy baby, for a little while anyway. When he was a few months old, he started having medical issues. To make a long story short, I can look back and see the hand of God all over that. Over the next three to four months, we went from being told that Ben would not likely not live past 16 to go home. We're never going to know what was wrong with him. We moved to Southeast Texas shortly after that, and I worked for a company there about 11 years. Around eight years old, Ben got another disease, a rare one. There were three cases in the U.S. at the time, and that was considered a lot. Over the next few years, we went from being told that Ben will probably be on dialysis most of his life and likely need a kidney transplant, to the doctors being baffled at the sudden change of events. Today, he's healthy. He monitors his kidneys yearly but he's on no medications at all. I can look back and see God's hand, His grace, His mercy, and power all over it. It just never dawned on me at the time. The doctors were baffled, and so was I, but I'm not anymore. During that time, our third child, Hannah, was born. And about a year later, we moved back to Louisiana, and I started working with MMR, a company where my older brother was one of the owners. There was a lot of traveling around with MMR, and the first job was a project in New Jersey. I was supposed to be there for 60 to 90 days, and it turned into two years. As you can imagine, that put a strain on the marriage. Around 1998, I knew that the marriage was over, particularly when she told me she was in love with somebody else. We separated. And I was having trouble supporting two households with the position I was in at the time. So when an opportunity for an assignment overseas came up, I took it. I was supposed to be going to Thailand, but I had to stop over in Arabia for two weeks. That two weeks turned into eight months, and I never did make it to Thailand. Lucy? Well, I was born, I'm sorry, I was born in New England into a large family of 15 children. I was number nine in the birth order, and the novelty of twin boys arrived one year after me. So I faded into the backdrop as my mom got busy caring for them. As a little girl, I was looked after and protected by my older sisters, who nurtured me like I was their own child. My life was mostly carefree, playing little girl games like hopscotch and jump rope, but mostly caring for all of the neighborhood animals. Once my older sisters moved on to begin their lives, I was on my own and surrounded by five older brothers, or five brothers older and younger, and one much younger sister. Not long after they moved out of the home, the secret abuse began when I was 11. It felt, left me feeling very vulnerable and confused about my identity and why this was happening. I felt so much shame and I kept it to myself. Most victims of sexual abuse believe that it's somehow their fault. But since then, God has showed me that this is a lie from the devil, and it's meant to keep us down and in bondage to him. Don't listen. My parents were so busy working, they didn't have time to look after us. They provided for our basic needs and oversaw the big things. 
At age 12, my mom took a full-time job. So I was co cooking dinner and cleaning for my dad and my siblings, which included my abusive older brothers. We were left unsupervised most of the time through my adolescent years. I resented my parents and my brothers for not looking out for me. My father was an overworked, frustrated, and very angry man who displayed his anger by yelling, cursing, and criticizing his kids. It was as if we children were a burden to him and that he would rather we didn't exist. I would watch from a distance as he beat my brothers with his belt. It was clear that it went way beyond spare the rod, spoil the child. I recall a time where he was beating my younger brother so badly that I called the police. That did not go well for me, by the way. I'm grateful that he was good to my mom. She was quiet, submissive, and a caring woman who loved God but kept her thoughts mostly to herself. I can remember seeing her in the forbidden room called the parlor. She sat in the big wingback chair, praying and reading her religious books. Since she lost her own mother at age four and her father by age 11, she was not equipped to nurture us or to look after us and protect us from our father's rage. I can remember years later, I asked my older sister, what was our mom like when we were little kids? And she said, she was great with the babies. And I think that's where we lost our connection with her because as soon as one was weaned and walking, there was another one on the way, as you can imagine. So the only thing that I remember about my mom as a child and the connection we had was she would wipe our noses, fix our lunches, and I would help her with the chores. I hid from my father as much as possible, and I had to protect myself from my brothers who would attempt to beat me up and torture my pets. Those of you who know me as being tough, well, now you know why. The struggle in my young heart was that I just wanted to be cherished and nurtured by my parents and especially my dad. But the reality was I was on my own without any protection or guidance. We were all just fighting to survive. The Catholic religion that we were raised in was one of do's and don'ts. We did go to confession on Saturday, and the priest would be in this confessional, and we would confess our sins, and it was all based on the Ten Commandments. We were taught that the priest was the one who goes between us and God. It wasn't real, and it wasn't helpful to me, but I still went through the motions because that's what was expected of me. I didn't understand the concept of repenting, turning away from my sin, and loving God, so I would make things up each week to confess. I never told the priest about the actual bad things going on in my life because, frankly, I didn't know or trust him. I couldn't see his face since the confession took place in a dark booth with a petition between us. He would listen to my list of don'ts, and he would give me a Catholic-sanctioned list of prayers to recite at the altar before I left. Then we went to Mass on Sunday, presumably with our souls washed clean. <clears throat> we also attended confirmation classes. This is to learn how to be good Catholics. And that is where they taught us that Jesus loved us. We, but since we were discouraged from reading the Bible, I knew nothing of what it said. So I only saw Jesus as a lifeless man on the cross at the front of the church and that he had no power to connect or to show me his love. As a child, I remember seeing the big white Bible in the forbidden fancy room that was off limits. And at the age of six, my curiosity got the best of me, so I went in when nobody was looking to check it out. I opened it up, but I didn't understand it. It didn't make any sense to me, so I did the next logical thing a six-year-old would do. I drew a picture of a stick girl in the front blank cover of the book, and I promptly got a spanking for it. So that's my exposure to the Bible as a child. Even as a young girl, I saw the hypocrisy with what we were taught and how the adults behaved. I know you parents in the audience can relate that we kids see so much more than we adults realize. 
We were told to be perfect in our behavior. We were taught that God was harsh, and if we weren't obedient in every way, that he would punish us. I often wondered when his hammer would come down. My father insisted we attend Mass on Sunday, but we re he really joined us. In my home, I experienced neglect, levels of abuse, anger, and vulgarity. I was exposed to discrimination toward others by my father, and it made me feel very uneasy. I knew in my heart that it really wasn't right. I saw the head priest as an angry and inappropriate man who loved his beer. He was unapproachable also. The full trash can of empty cans behind his living quarters, known as the rectory, was visible to all. During Mass on Sunday, I would look around and see all the people in their beautiful clothes and their pretty lady hats. But they didn't speak to or look at one another. There was warmth. No, there was not warmth. It wasn't available there. So during the Mass, they was speaking partially in Latin. Everyone dutifully looked ahead, following orders to repeat after the priest, kneeling, sitting, and standing at the appointed times. And at the end of the service, they would spill out of the beautiful building with its stained glass windows, get in their cars, and drive away. So, better? OK. So we would go home to our hostile environment, and the contrast of the solemn and perfect behavior in church was all too real to me. I couldn't see the point in being around God because for what I knew, he looked a lot like my dad, who was scary and unapproachable. So I distanced myself from him as much as I could while still fulfilling my outward duties as a good Catholic girl. By the age of 14, I stopped pretending, stopped going to church, and began to act out. My father often compared us younger kids to the older siblings that had moved on to live up their own lives. He would brag about their successes while he had only negative things to say to his younger kids at home. It made me feel like such a failure. I tried to get his favor by working hard in school and helping my mom to care for the siblings and the household. I wanted to be good at things, so I tried out for various school activities, only to be told, no, I couldn't do those things. The absence of support and grace was very painful. At age 12, I lost my virginity to a stranger in our quiet suburban neighborhood who forced himself on me. I never saw him again, but unfortunately that would not be the last time I would have to endure this horrific act by strangers. I started to experiment with marijuana and discovered the alcohol my father kept in the bedroom closet. When I look back, I know the enemy was working very hard to destroy my life and the lives of my family members. John 10.10 10 says, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. But then Jesus says, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Awesome. At the time, I had no idea that Jesus came to give me a full life and that the God of the Bible was so loving and such a gracious God who desired a relationship with me. The substance abuse became a regular part of my life as I experimented with stronger drugs and alcohol. By age 14, I felt so hopeless I attempted to take my life. Thank God I failed. By then, I had become sexually active, trying to gain acceptance and love from strangers through unhealthy relationships but it only left me feeling sad and empty. I didn't understand why I was drowning myself in destructive behaviors, but looking back, I see that I was hurting so deeply inside, I just wanted to escape. At age 15, there was so much turmoil between me and my parents that I ran away and was brought back at least a couple of times and harshly punished. My family desperately needed biblical counseling, but there was none. I wanted to stay in school, but I felt I had to drop out while in the 10th grade so the police wouldn't be able to find me and take me back to that home. When I first left, I lived on the streets of a small city near my hometown. I would sleep in cars on the street and steal from the grocery store to fill my belly. Early one morning, I remember wandering into a little cafe after a rough night and the owner saw my desperate need. He gave me a warm drink and something to eat. I will never forget him. 
At the time, I didn't realize he was an angel from the Lord. And there are countless other times when the hand of God was protecting me. I lived on the city streets for a short time and then found myself in a home where hippies and drug dealers were communing together. The devil had me right where he wanted me, unsafe, unloved, and on the path to destruction. At this point, at 15, I was taking mind-altering drugs and found myself in dangerous situations where I act one after the other what I was taking advantage of over and over. This led me to sink even lower into a sense of hopelessness and despair. I learned later in life that my mom had been constantly praying for her children. I honestly believe it's what kept me from complete destruction. John, 1 John 5.14 tells us, and this is the confidence that we have towards him. If we ask anything to his will, he hears us. I know his will was for me to become his child, to be healed, and to serve him. I eventually moved on in with an older sister who was thrown out of the house by my father and was also living a wild lifestyle. So I continued on that same destructive path. It's a miracle that all the danger that I had been exposed to, that I was still alive and physically unharmed. Then one day I met a man named Jerry a church friend of my mom's who was a gracious and loving Christian man who spoke to me about Jesus. And this is the first time I heard the blessed gospel of Jesus Christ. He told me how Jesus had saved him from the life of alcoholism, adultery, and ultimately saved his marriage. He was so genuine, he accepted me right where I was without expecting anything in return. I had never experienced that type of love before but I didn't trust or understand it. I wasn't ready to receive Jesus. I thought that this was good for Jerry. God could save him, but never help or save me, especially after I had rejected him. <coughs> so, the Lord was pursuing me that I would become his daughter. I just didn't know it yet. Ephesians 2.10 tells us, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So even before I understood anything about God, he was loving, protecting, and pursuing me. After a few months, I moved in with this boyfriend that was much older than I, who had a problem with excessive drinking and a terrible temper. He would work all week and spend his paycheck in one night at the bar. I worked at Burger King to make some money, but it didn't pay all the bills. Even his own mother told me not to marry him. While I was living with him, my mom would quietly bring groceries to our door and leave them. She was watching out for me, although I never knew how she was aware of my desperate situation. I guess it's true what they say, that moms just know. So. Around that time, my mom spoke to my oldest brother, who was a Navy pilot stationed in Texas. She asked him to take me back to live with them, and there, and I did. I, I went to live with them. Unfortunately, his wife was not so enthusiastic about having me live there with him and their newborn baby. But the few months I stayed with them, I completed my GED, I moved out on my own, and joined the Air Force. After training, I was stationed in England and spent time there working, but was still very broken in my heart and mind. I drank heavily and I continued to do drugs, which interfered with my work. There was this colonel who was in charge of my unit, who was kind and looked out for me. He was like the father that I always wished I had had. I consider him another one of the angels God had put into my path to look out for me. He eventually helped me with an honorable discharge so I could move on and live my life. But not having anyone to go home to after my discharge, I turned around and went back to England and joined up with a friend who was stationed there, and we proceeded to have drinking parties and deal drugs to the military and the locals. So here I am going deeper. A year later, I got very close to being arrested by the British authorities, so I left and went to California for a few months then to New York for a short time, to Boston for a year, and eventually settled in South Florida at age 21, where my life was about to radically change. 
Throughout my journey across the globe, I ran into Jesus followers. They would witness to me about the love of God, but I was curse at them, and I would go about my destructive way. I was a very scary person to witness to because I had a lot of anger, but they didn't give up. I refused to believe that the God of my childhood could love me. But while in Florida, God turned up the heat, and it seemed like everywhere I turned, there were Jesus followers telling me how wonderful he is and how much he wanted to save me. I call them the hounds of heaven. And just like my mom's friend Jerry, they were different than the non-Jesus people that I had been around. These Christians were kind and only wanted to show me the love of Jesus. And again, they asked me for nothing in return. Although I started to clean up my behavior somewhat, I was still drinking, regularly using drugs, and living a promiscuous lifestyle. And in spite of all this, I worked hard and paid my way through college. Then I landed a job which became my career. Over time, my heart began to warm up to this Jesus I had heard so much about. But I still had a ways to go. At age 24, I became pregnant. And the one person that I confided in at the time told me, get rid of it. You don't want a kid. So against my own conscience and my better judgment telling me no, 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 I went through with the abortion of the only child that I would ever conceive. I immediately felt sick inside and I felt worse as the reality of it sank in. I cried for months and I had trouble sleeping for what I had done to this innocent little baby. I felt, felt a sense of hopeless desperation since my life was so empty and that is, in, that is in spite of my worldly success. At this point, I was trying to do anything to get relief. I borrowed a Bible from one of the Christians in my life and started reading. I am not sure why, but I went to the last book and I read Revelation. It was fascinating to me. I couldn't believe that the God that I ran from my whole life was so amazing. So then I went to the book of John and then Romans, reading about salvation, and while sitting in my little apartment, I called out to Jesus. And I said, oh Jesus, if you are who these people tell me you are, I want to surrender my life to you, and I want to ask you to forgive my sins. I need help. I immediately felt a rush of freedom, and the dark cloak that covered me for so long was lifted. I was so excited, I couldn't stop talking about him to everyone. <laughs> so, that day I began my relationship with Jesus, attending church and reading my Bible every chance I got. I can remember attempting to read the Bible and, and telling my roommate about how God saved me. She thought I had lost my mind. She moved out shortly after that. I was just so radically <coughs> saved that I was no longer the girl that she knew. I was a new creation in Christ Jesus. I had become one of the hounds of heaven. Praise him. I got counseling for all the hurts and wounds of my past. I got involved in Bible studies, pro-life ministries, and served wherever there was a need in church. After eight years of being faithful, I became restless because I had a strong desire to be married and have children. And when it didn't happen from the Lord as I prayed, I pursued it on my own. I started dating a man who said, I am a Christian, but after getting to know him, it was clear that he didn't know God. So I set out to change his mind and get him to be a good Christian. Trust me when I say, missionary dating does not work. I found myself back in the devil's snare, anxious, sad, and empty. After three years of being out of God's will and feeling hopeless again, I got counseling from faithful Christian women who helped me to get back into fellowship with the Lord and his people. It took me years to recover, and I learned a very valuable lesson in that experience. Stay close to God, be patient, and wait on him. And the verse that came, I came away with in that is 1 Corinthians 10, 12. Let him who thinks he stands take heed that he does not fall. I had become prideful and thought I could never fail God. I had promised him that I would wait for the man of God he chose for me. I also learned that he is so faithful. When we cry out to him, I decided to follow God whether he 
answered my prayers according to my desire or not. I was in my early 40s at the time. I embraced being single and serving God in my singleness. Now it may sound strange, but Yandu, Saudi Arabia was where the Lord started getting my attention. The second day I was there, my brother, who was over all the overseas projects for the company, arrived. When we finally got a chance to talk one-on-one, -on -one, he asked me if I had been going to church, which I said no. He asked how I was doing, knowing there were problems at home, and I told him fine. Then he asked if I ever read the Bible. Again, I had to say no. So he reached into his briefcase and pulled out a little green pocket Bible. He suggested I read it. He said I might find some answers in it. For those not familiar with the pocket Bible, it includes the four Gospels, Psalms, and Proverbs. For those not familiar with Arabia, there's not a whole lot to do after work except read unless you're a Muslim. So I started reading this pocket Bible, and now and then as I read, I can only describe was the Lord was trying to get my attention. He was sending me messages that I didn't quite understand. Around Christmas time, I had to go back to the U.S. to get a work visa for this Arabia job, and I poked my head into Alan's office, and I thanked him for giving me the little pocket Bible. He got so excited, he said he knew what he was going to get me for Christmas. Now, the gift didn't come in before I had to go back, but it was waiting for me when I returned in May of 1998. Over the next couple of years, traveling from various jobs around the country, I started reading my new NIV study Bible with my name on the front. Then, in November of 2000, my son and I went to a job in Venezuela. God kept impressing upon me there was more in His Word than I was able to understand. I had read the Bible cover to cover, and it parked in on other books of the Bible, but the more that I listened to it, I realized that I couldn't stand up to God's standards. God's call to be holy, righteous, pure, etc., and the more I read, the more I convinced myself I couldn't do it. So I left you in my 40s and in my singleness, content to serve God in that way. Then something amazing happened. I met a man who was seeking God and reading his Bible every day. He was honest, gracious, patient, and a complete gentleman. And I thought he was handsome too. After a few months of dating, we decided we belonged together, so we got engaged. And we did what most couples do, we started planning our wedding. But since we were living in two separate countries, we had to do our marriage counseling per the pastor by instant message. Does anyone remember A-O-L-I-M? <laughs> I'm dating myself. We went through Dennis Rainey's book, which was very thorough, right down to the question where we were saved. So the man that I'm preparing to marry responds, that's, and he says, there's no way he's going to heaven. I was shocked. He knew the Bible better than most Christians, and his behavior was above reproach. I realized I couldn't go ahead with this marriage. I took off my engagement ring, quickly ran and got my Bible that had all the verses starred to help me lead others to Jesus. I shared the verses with him, and all the while I prayed for his soul. To back up just a little bit, in mid-2001, I started communicating with this young lady with a beautiful smile on a Christian dating website I had stumbled across one day. I remember her profile said, if you love the Lord and you love dogs, we can talk. <laughs> So after that, as we instant messaged, talked on the phone, we always had our Bibles by our sides, and we always got into the Bible. And I wasn't much of a prayer, but we always prayed. In November of 2001, I had to go back to the U.S. to renew my visa, because just prior to meeting Lucy, I had agreed to another year in Venezuela. 
While I was there, I asked her to marry me, and much to my surprise, she said yes. Another time, we met with the pastor in Florida, as Lucy talked about, and he agreed that we could use this marriage preparation book since I was unable to attend the classes in Florida. And then we came to that question that changed my life forever. It was a multiple choice question to the effect, what are your chances of going to heaven? I chose D, no chance at all. There was no reply from Lucy on the other end. So I instant messaged her, what did you put? Again, there was no reply. Then I texted again, hello? And there was still nothing. I found out later that she had just assumed that I was a born again believer. But now there was no way that she could be yoked with an unbeliever. 2 Corinthians 6.14 says, Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? But the Lord wasn't finished with her or me. She told me later she realized she had to tell me the good news about Jesus. Then she asked me a question no one had ever asked me before. Have you ever received Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior? I was stunned to say the least. Then she took me down the Romans road. Romans 3.10 says that no one is righteous, no not one. And Romans 3.23 said all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And I was thinking, yeah, yeah, I got that. And Romans 6.23 says for the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. All of a sudden, things started to click. Romans 5, 8. God shows His love for us in that while we were still sinners, He sent Jesus to die for our sins. Then Romans 10, 9 and 10. said, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. Romans 12, 2 says, Be transformed by the renewal of your mind. I've often described it as just fireworks going off. All at once, the Lord opened my eyes, my ears, and my heart. And everything I had been reading these past few years suddenly made sense. I couldn't do it, but He did. Mm -hmm. She told me later, when I instant messaged her, I said, I get it. She was skeptical. But that was the beginning of my walk with the Lord. I was 47 years old, and He's still working on me. I still had another year to be in Venezuela, where I didn't speak the language, so I continued to read my Bible, and have never stopped. Lucy and I communicated frequently, instant messaging or by phone, and she would always bring up Bible study. And one day I had to ask, what is a Bible study? Well, that opened a whole new realm of possibilities when she told me I could find Bible studies online. The first study I found or ran across was called Acts 17.11. Now, this is where the noble Bereans would listen to Paul the Apostle preach, and they were eagerly receiving it. But then they went back and they checked the scriptures to make sure what he was telling them was accurate. Paul was so excited that they didn't just blindly accept the teachings of man, but they went directly to God's Word to confirm it. I've never forgotten that lesson that God teaches us. Now, I'm an introvert, and for a number of reasons, I'm not typically comfortable with groups, especially large groups. When Lucy started talking about small groups and fellowship, my first thoughts were, Wait a minute, I've got my fire insurance. All this stuff just seems uncomfortable. I don't think I need that. But God had other plans. One thing Lucy and I decided very early on was that we would be in our Bible daily. And we have made a habit of reading our Bible and praying together daily. Even when I was away for a week when we first moved up here, every morning before I went to work, we read in our Bible together, and we prayed. I've often shared with others over the years 
the importance and rewards of praying with your spouse and being in God's Word. I've encouraged them if they don't do it, start it. You won't be sorry. We've been involved in small groups ever since I got back from Venezuela, which is in November of 2002. We've been participants in groups. We've facilitated many studies. We've hosted groups in our home. And I felt personally the community with the body that comes from worshiping together and not just Sundays in church. So it took years for my heart to heal from all the damage that had been done. And God has taken my ashes and turned them into beauty. He's given me opportunities to minister to other women who've experienced abuse in their young lives. Over the past few years, I've been working with those who are struggling with the trauma of sexual abuse, abortions, and addiction. And the Lord has given David and I the desire to serve the body of Christ to help others realize their potential and calling from Him. His blessings and favor are amazing. Walking with the Lord has been a lifelong journey, and to this day, He is continuing to transform me into the woman He created me to be. I am a work in process, and the more of me I submit to God, the better I am equipped to handle the fiery darts of the enemy. I still have a ways to go to discover about my Lord, but the one thing I know is, as I spend more time with Jesus, the more of His Spirit is in me, and the more I desire Him. One of my go-to verses is Galatians 5, 22 and 23. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control. Against these things there is no law. That's what I strive for in my life. Thank you all. Thank you, David and Lucy. Thank you guys so much. It takes a lot of courage to come up and tell your story. Just getting up on a stage and talking is, is not always easy. It's easy for you. No, it's it's not easy for me. You don't know what a mess I am leading up to the service. but You make it look easy. Well, to God be the glory. Yes. I just, I want to thank you guys so much. Um, I want to, we want to hear some more stories too. And if God's given you a story to tell, we want to hear your story. So, Get in, holler at me. You know, we want to do a little more of this. The takeaway that I get, you guys, is both of you needed Jesus. You, you, you know, you heard Lucy tell her story of a, a life that was, you, you kind of knew it was out there, and you needed Jesus. David's life, at least later on, looked like it was all together. Even knew a lot about the Bible, but still needed Jesus. We all need Jesus so very much. Thank you for being a part of this, and uh, I just, I, you guys pray for each other, and pray for me, and I'll pray for you, and I want to finish up our service today by praying for some special people. I want to pray for Kelly, who's got some surgery coming up, pretty major surgery, so pray for Kelly, that's on the 2nd of September, right? We want to pray for Debbie Brady, who's got some surgery coming up, I believe, Thursday of this week. So that's how we're going to finish up our services. Would you join me in prayer right now? Heavenly Father, thank you so much for giving David and Lucy the courage and the heart to share what you've done for them. And I pray the things you've done for them, you would do for more and more people. We know that the gospel is life-changing. So I pray for everyone who is receiving this message, either here in person or in recorded form later on, that you would work in their hearts and bring them to a saving understanding of Jesus. Bring them the faith in Him. Lord, we want to pray for Debbie Brady, who's got surgery coming up. And we pray for Kelly, who's got surgery coming up, that your mighty hand would be on them and that things would go so well. We give you the glory in advance. In Jesus' name, amen.